Peterson is one of the most famous intellectuals in the world, but he also has a day job. He's a professor of psychology and a clinical psychologist. He's the author of a new book called Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. Dr. Jordan Peterson joins us now. Dr. Peterson, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. It's much appreciated on my side as well. So this is going to be one of the very unusual book interviews that's actually about the book, because you're <laughs> one of the you're, you're one of the few authors who writes interesting books. So let's get into the book. Twelve more rules for life. What are they? Well, you can't have too many rules. So twelve more seemed appropriate. So if you were to go through and list them, which of course you did, what would you put? at number one? I think of this, in this book, um, it would be, be grateful in spite of your suffering. <laughs> Although abandoned ideology is probably a close second. T tell us what it means to be grateful in spite of your suffering. Well, I think it, it, it means that the adoption of a kind of voluntary courage in relationship to the troubles of life, I mean, you know, we hear about people who do, um, what would you say, incomprehensible, take incomprehensible actions quite frequently. People who shoot up schools and engage in, in heinous acts, mass shootings and so forth. And they're driven by a tremendous bitterness about the conditions of their life, um, rightly or wrongly. They're, they're tortured by their own psychology. They feel... Uh, prey to the tyranny of society, and they're made uncomfortable by their intrinsic vulnerability, and those are problems that we all face, right? Uh, the inadequacy of our biological structure and the catastrophe of our social relations and the iniquity of our own heart, and it's very easy to become bitter as a consequence of that. But, and you can make a case for the bitterness because life is extraordinarily difficult, and everyone dies, and everyone we love dies, and and it, it's easy to become nihilistic, but it's not helpful in any way. And I tried to describe gratitude as an act of courage and as a voluntarily adopted attitude towards life that is much more likely to reduce the sum total of suffering in the world, let's say, than to add to it. And so it's something to practice. It's not precisely a rational conclusion that life is constituted such that anyone sensible would be grateful. Um, you meet people who've had extraordinarily terrible experiences, and, but you know, when you meet someone like that and you admire them, you also see that they, there's a nobility that characterizes the manner in which they've conducted themselves through their trials, and that seems deeply admirable. And you know, I think our instinct to admire is a reliable instinct and it points us at higher things and so to be courageous and grateful in spite of life's inequality and suffering is a noble goal and so that was the purpose of that chapter so two observations about what you just said the first is that you describe life as inherently the experience at least in part of suffering suffering isn't something that happens to the unlucky you seem to be saying suffering is something that happens to all of us because it's just, it's what life is. Do you believe that? Yeah, well, in, in chapter 11, I try to make a really formal case for that. Uh, the chapter 11 is um, do not allow yourself to become deceitful, arrogant, or resentful, um, although I may have the order of those wrong in my recitation. I, I tried to point out, I suppose it's an existential chapter in some sense, and what I mean by that is that I use the chapter to try to describe the broad categories of trials and tribulations that we all face. And I made some reference to them when I was discussing chapter 12 just now, that we face the harshness of the natural world and the inevitability of illness and death. And we face the tyranny of our social structures. And then we face the um, malevolence and ignorance that characterizes our individual psyches. And those are permanent existential problems that every human being faces and has faced throughout history and will face into the future as long as we're still recognizably human. And so it's necessary to understand that that's part of the intrinsic structure of being. Um, it, it depersonalizes it to some degree and, and it, it makes it 
part of a, the universal set of problems that we all face. And I suppose that also might aid in generosity and understanding. I mean, it's clearly the case that some people have it harder than other people, especially at any particular time. But there is no one who escapes this life unscathed, regardless of their, let's say, financial circumstances or the other gifts that they might have either earned or had bestowed upon them. And it's necessary. You see, otherwise, if you don't understand this, it's very easy to make the unconscious assumption, for example, that the reason that they're suffering is because of the evil of our social structures, for example. And, and they are inadequate frequently and, and often corrupt as well, especially in comparison to the ideal. But it's a mistake to localize suffering like that. It gives you a, it, prov it, 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 it provides you with a, a, a convenient target for the locale of evil and, and for example, and reduces the responsibility that you have to take for the nature of your own experience. So you need a sophisticated view of, of life and its troubles. And well, that's partly what chapter 11 was supposed to provide. So in other words, you're saying that people suffer not simply because bad people are in charge, but because people always suffer. Bad people may be in charge, but you're going to suffer well, anyway. Bad people are. Bad people are always in charge to some degree, right? I mean, because <laughs> right. none of us, well, none of us are perfect. And right. it isn't obvious that if you or I were in charge, for example, that that would be a radical improvement with regards to the world's net total of badness, we might say. You know, it, we're always faced with the problem of inadequate social institutions. But I think it's more appropriate to view that as a human problem rather than to point to, you know, uh, uh, an easily identifiable set of intrinsically malevolent perpetrators who bear no relationship whatsoever to ourselves. Um, it's an immature way of looking at the world. I mean, people are pretty much, well, we're all flawed, put, put it that way. And, and all of us carry the same propensity for tyranny in some sense that we often accuse our leaders of manifesting. So, and I think that's best constrained within the confines of your own soul, at least it's safer. That's safer than taking it out on someone else. Let's say, yes. That isn't to say I, you know, I. It's not. It's not like I fail to recognize that there are times when social action is necessary, political action and action at the level of the group. But I'm a psychologist, and I tend to concentrate more on the role of the individual and the responsibilities of the individual. So it sounds like you're skeptical of the claim, which we often hear that if we could just change the system, everything would be perfect. Yeah, well, <laughs> good luck with that. Um, you know, changing, changing something to make it better is extraordinarily difficult, especially when it's something complex, especially when it's something complex that's already functioning moderately well. I mean, there's very few among us who would take a monkey wrench into a power plant, but there are many of us who would discuss the transformation of the world's uh, means of generating electricity, let's say, or of generating energy. You know, we have a misguided sense of how complex these systems are and, and an over, what would you say, an overestimation of our ability to make them better as a mere application of some ideological presupposition. It's especially true with regards to the institutions that we've formulated, I would say, in the last several hundred years in the West, because they're extraordinarily functional by historical standards by world standards, for that matter, and flawed though they may be, they're better than anything that's ever been produced. And to think that you can, by some whim, magically make them better, especially as a consequence of some revolutionary transformation that's ideologically predicated, is it's a sign both of a profound historical ignorance, um, an uh, overarching narcissism, and uh, of uh, deep, deep hidden malevolence. All combination of all of those things. I, I, I hope that our viewers are listening very carefully to what you're saying, because there's just there's a lot there and it's profound. But if I were to sum it up, what I hear you asking for is humility and perspective. How do you inculcate those things in a population? Well, I think you do it by enticing people. You know, I, I, I put out a little clip from an interview I had recently with Chris Williamson about truth. So 
you know, one of the things that revolutionary movements have to offer young people is a sense of romantic adventure. I mean, if you're working at 7-Eleven in a dead-end job, I don't mean to single out 7-Eleven or jobs of that sort. I'm, I'm using a cliche for rhetorical purposes. And you're offered an adventure, the chance to demonstrate, you know, dramatically for a, for a messianic cause. Especially if you're young, that's going to call to something deep inside you and excite you because everyone needs a higher purpose. And that can be, that longing can be addressed by romantically inclined ideologues, but there are better ways of addressing that longing, I believe. And this clip I referred to, I, I, I was trying to make the case that there's tremendous adventure in doing something like telling the truth. You know, people often use their language in a expedient form, in a, in a manipulative form. So, for example, before this interview, I could have sat down and decided that the purpose of the interview was to sell a certain number of books, let's say, and that I should spin the conversation in a manner most likely to make that occur. Or I could decide that I was just going to say what I thought as a consequence of your questions and let the conversation go wherever it goes, wherever the spirit might take it, so to speak. And there's a tremendous adventure in that, in, in, in that kind of, uh, what would you say, ethical. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demanding ethical striving. And it's a form of responsibility to pay attention to what you say and to only say things that you believe to be true. And there's an insane adventure in that because you have no idea what's going to happen if you do that. And you, you, you entice people into adopting ethical responsibility by pointing out to them in story and perhaps to the degree you're capable by example that there isn't anything more interesting or meaningful that they could possibly do. And I, I genuinely believe that to be the case. So, and I think that's part of the reason that my books and lectures have proved popular. I'm, I'm making a case for some things, I suppose, that you might regard as obvious, um, at least when viewed from a certain perspective. When I was talking to large live audiences during my last book tour, I noted that one topic in particular would bring the audience to a dead silent halt constantly, and that was when I made a rhetorical case for the relationship between responsibility and meaning. And you need a meaning in life. You, ne you need a purpose to sustain you through the catastrophe of life, through the suffering of life. You need a meaning. It's not optional. And the deeper the meaning, the better. And it's definitely the case that people find that meaning primarily in the adoption of responsibility. And that case isn't being made well in our culture, especially not to young people. But there's a, there's a hunger, a mass hunger for that idea. And I suppose that's because it's been ignored or hasn't been articulated well for you know, a number of decades in the, in the popular culture. But that's where the, it's better than happiness, that meaning. It's deeper than happiness, which is, happiness is fleeting and, and, easily, uh, and easily chased away, I suppose, in some sense by misery. But the meaning that comes along with the adoption of heavy responsibility, that's sustaining through good times and bad. It's always, it's always Tucker, it's always the case that the best story wins. You know, and so it's up to people who, for example, would like to push back against the romantic ideologues to craft a better narrative, one that's more attractive, and entice people in a direction that isn't counterproductive. It's just fascinating to me, having watched carefully as you've ascended from, you know, your position as a psycho clinical psychologist in Canada, a man most Americans had never heard of, to where you are now, which is, I think it's fair to say, one of the leading intellectuals in the world. Um, and if I were to trace the moment, at least in the U.S., where people began to know your name, I think you'd have to go back to the now famous interview you did, and I just want to remind our viewers of if they haven't seen it, uh, with Kathy Newman on Channel 4 in the UK. I just want to play a short clip of this to kind of set the stage. Here it was. There's, a, there's something, I know you've seen that clip a thousand times. There's something beautiful about that because your posture is totally non-aggressive. 
and you're allowing your ideas to, to speak for you, the force of your ideas to, to carry you forward. What do you think, I know, and I know it's hard to assess one's own career, but what do you think about that, why was that moment a kind of defining one for you, at least in the United States? Yeah, that's, a, that's an unbelievably complicated question. Um, it, it has, to, part of it was the revelation of the nature of our, of our, of our, of our culture's popular media especially in the light of new technological change. So when I went into the studio, I, I spoke with Kathy uh, before the interview, and we talked like two human beings. It, it was reasonably friendly and, and courteous and professional. And then when the cameras turned on, she was a completely different person. And I've met that person many times now. She was TV journalist. And instead of having a conversation with me, which in its optimal form is a mutual uh, exchange of ideas in the attempt to further exploration of the truth, she adopted a particular kind of uh, persona, a, a devil's advocate persona, which was oriented partly to fulfilling her role as, let's say, TV journalist, but also to further her career as a hard, tough, you know, investigative journalist who wouldn't take any nonsense. And she continually interacted with me in a manner that had absolutely nothing to do with me. Um, and in, in some sense, I suppose, really nothing to do with her either. She would accuse me of certain viewpoints, which bore no relationship whatsoever to the viewpoints that I actually had, and refused to converse with me in, in any normal manner. And so there were the reason that became culturally significant, I believe, at least to some degree, was that it revealed very clearly the inadequate nature of the manner in which journalists, by and large, interact with their uh, guests, let's say, in yes. the public sphere. I mean, look, now I do podcasts mostly, and, and I have my own podcast as well, and those conversations are unscripted. They go wherever they're going to go, and they're dependent for their utility on the quality of the interaction. And I would also say the genuineness and the honesty of the interaction, because yes. long form YouTube punishes people who are deceptive very brutally. Um, every time I go into a television studio, almost without fail, I'm struck by the artifice of the situation and the transformation of the journalist into, well, it's something cliched as a talking head, but, but into someone who's certainly not acting like a normal human being. And I think that was very, very clear. There were many things going on in that interview. I was also reflective of a deep political polarization. I mean, Kathy Newman pilloried me in some sense, or parodied me as a relatively clueless, alt-right, uh, what would you say, pretender, um, and proceeded to treat me as if that's who I was. And the truth of the matter is that's not who I was so, or who I am. And so that didn't go very well. And I think that was very, very evident to the audience, especially as the interview proceeded. I mean, I was stunned that they put it up, um, actually. <laughs> I couldn't believe they released the interview as a whole and also believe that it had gone quite well when it, it certainly went well in terms of it being interesting. but. It, it didn't go well as an interview that reflected well on Ms. Newman or on the uh, business, the enterprise, that, that gave rise to the interview. Quite the contrary. And if you look at the YouTube comments, and there's hundreds of thousands of them now, um, they're, they're very, very critical of, of the manner in which the interview was conducted. So, so, so she, was, she simply wasn't equipped really to get, have the conversation that she had spurred with you but what I, at all. But what I was so struck by was she didn't really want to know what you thought. And it's not just Kathy Newman, whom I don't know, and I don't want to pick on her uh, specifically. There are many like her. But she didn't want to get information from you. She didn't want to understand what you were trying to say. She was trying to discredit and silence you, obviously. I, I'm in this world. Trust me, that's what she was trying to do. But why? Why 
you're not a representative of a political party. You're not, I've never heard you say anything openly political, you know, advocate for any elected official. You're a clinical psychologist. Why do you think she found you threatening enough to try and silence you? Well, it wasn't exactly that she was trying to silence me, right? She was trying to reduce me to, to a dismissible parody. Right. I would exactly. say, which, which is even more effective in some sense than, than silencing. And of course, that's, that, that attempt has been made in relationship to me many, many, many times. It's, it's, it's like a weekly occurrence or a monthly occurrence. And I've really, and I, I presumed this would all go away back, it started in 2016. So I've been in the public eye since the fall of 2016 intensely. And I presumed that I would have my 15 minutes of fame and that I would disappear from view and go back to my life. And that just didn't happen. And, and increasingly, it happened less and less, which was very surprising to me and still remains surprising. And I've, I've tried to think it through. Why, why is this, why am I at the center of this in the manner that I am? Um, I mean, there's other public intellectuals who play a similar role. Stephen Pinker, arguably, Jonathan Haidt, arguably, um, Bjorn Lomberg, to some degree. These are people I have great respect for. Um, Douglas Murray. There are other people who occupy a position that's analogous to mine, and then some online as well, like Joe Rogan would be an example, although I think he has a larger audience than me. Um, but you know, Nellie Bowles, a New York Times journalist, did a very sophisticated uh, evisceration of me um, about four years ago, and she said, she, called, she titled it, custodian of the patriarchy, which was an insult. But you know, <laughs> I've thought about that for Shouldn't a long time. And well, the thing is, is that is right. And I'll, I'll tell you why it's right, as far as I can tell is, I mean, first of all, I am a university professor and I've taught at Harvard and I taught at the University of Toronto. And those are two of the finest institutions in, in the world. And so I represent that, um, I represent that tradition, let's say, validly. But I'm a scientist. I have a, a, a reasonable number of publications that are reasonably cited, so I'm a credible scientist. But I'm also someone who takes religious thought extremely seriously. And so I have one foot in two worlds. And I suppose they are the two worlds that are parodied as the patriarchy, you know, the Enlightenment scientific world, which I have great respect for and which is in large part responsible for the staggering improvements in our standard of living, in, in the standard of living all around the world in the last several hundred years. But I'm also a great admirer of the ethical substructure, the narratives, the stories that underlie that, that make up part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and a deeper tradition than that even. It, it, it extends back farther than that. So I do think I am in some sense, placed properly to be the symbolic custodian of the patriarchy. And uh, I would also say that that's a responsibility that I take dead seriously. And so I think that's, you know, it's hard for me to tell because I'm in the middle of this and I, it's hard to separate my ego and, and my self-centeredness from some, and, and to step away from that to the degree that I can and to see my situation with some degree of objectivity, it, perhaps it's impossible, but, but these things do keep happening and they can't, may, may, may it, ask it's you to not pause merely and, chance. May, may, may I ask you to pause and just back up a little bit and define the term, if you would, patriarchy. What is the patriarchy? We're all supposed to dislike the patriarchy, but what is it and should we dislike it? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a symbol, really. Um, you know, I pointed out in my books that order is generally symbolized in literature and in art as masculine and chaos as feminine. And those aren't value-laden terms, by the way, because, well, chaos is where you find yourself when you don't know where you are, and order is where you are when things are going the way you want them to, and both of those domains are they're, they make up the bedrock of our existence, those two domains, and they're of equal value <laughs> um, and, and equal dangerousness and equal benefit. Um, but society tends to be symbolized with masculine symbols, and 
although I've been criticized for pointing that out, people who talk about the patriarchy fall into precisely that symbolic usage. And so the patriarchy is essentially society, um, hierarchical society, hypothetically structured by men, um, which is an oversimplification to a great degree, but it's symbolically accurate. Um, and it, 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 for, for people who are inclined towards a certain kind of revolutionary rhetoric or ideology, that society is the source of all that's tyrannical and, and malevolent. So if you assume, for example, that our social structures are predicated on nothing but power, which is a common trope among postmodernists influenced by Derrida and Foucault, the French intellectuals, and by Marx as well, although he talked more about economics than power. If you assume that our social structures are merely the consequence of the arbitrary exercise of power, then you can place malevolence into society. And then, well, then you have a, a, a cause for everything that's gone astray in the world, and you have an enemy that isn't you, that you can be morally superior to, and, and, and then you also can justify your behavior with your utopian dream, which is that, you know, if you were somehow given control of the patriarchy, well, the ut utopia would arrive the next day, which of course is complete nonsense. So the patriarchy is society and hypothetically run by men, hypothetically run by white men for their own selfish, narrow interests and power is what it's all about. And, you know, I guess the other reason that people are not very happy with me often is because I believe that that's utter, utterly ridiculous and that our societies are only predicated on power when they become corrupt. And that if you attribute all malevolence to society, that says a lot more about you than it does about society. So I suppose statements like that don't make me very popular among revolutionaries who think that if they just overthrew the current power structure and put up a new polity based on their ideology that the kingdom of heaven would arrive tomorrow. That's the promise of every revolution, isn't it? I want to play uh, for our viewers your description or your, your reaction to the term white privilege, which I think is maybe the most succinct and interesting I've heard. Jordan Peterson on white privilege. Here it is. To what degree is my pre present level of attainment or achievement a consequence of my white privilege? And I don't mean sort of. I mean, do you mean 5%? Do you mean 15%? Do you mean 25%? Do you mean 75%? And what do you propose I do about it? How about a tax? How about a tax that's like specialized for me so that I can account for my damn privilege you so that I can stop right hearing now. about it? <laughs> Quantify your white privilege. I don't think I've heard anybody say that and I was grateful to hear you say it. What is white privilege exactly? Well, I suppose it's the reverse of, of, of of racism um, in, in a culture that's primarily dominated by Caucasians. I mean, if you just invert the concept of racism, so there's people who are oppressed by racism, um, they tend to be non-Caucasians, uh, let's say. You just invert that, and instead of saying that those who aren't Caucasians are oppressed, you say that those who are are privileged, which means fundamentally that they don't... <laughs> it means two things. It means that the majority in a population may have advantages that the minority does not have. And there is some truth in that because every society sets itself up so that the majority benefits. But the more, ins most, more insidious part of that is that, well, if what you have is a consequence of undeserved privilege, then what makes you think you have any right to it? So then I could materially liberate it, let's say, to use the newest terminology and have all of God and morality on my side. And, you know, this is something that all the corporations who are moving so rapidly in the woke direction and pillorying themselves for their systemic racism and the undeserved nature of their privilege might think seriously uh, about, uh, given that the doctrine from which those notions are derived is anti-capitalist to the core and certainly predicated on the idea that if you have any position of authority in one of these systemically racist institutions that you know more deserve it than any slaveholder might. So, so what well, you're saying is they constructed... Like that, that make me unpopular as well. So you're, you're calling this, in effect, a moral justification for theft. 
it's a moral justification for many things. I, I suppose it's a moral justification for feeling morally superior above all. You know, yeah. and, and part of what I'm doing in my books, I think, I'm hoping, is to try to replace a false ethic with a real ethic. And because, because we need a real ethic. It, it's not optional. Um, and it, the, the call to ethical striving is real. But I believe that the West got it right by insisting that the proper locale for the ultimate ethical battle is in the soul of the individual and not between groups. And, and this insistence in our society that the group is the fundamental level of, of classification and identification is unbelievably degenerative and dangerous uh, and as well allows for this displacement of morality and the too easy identification of evil. It's, it's very, very dangerous. Why do you say that? Where does it end up? What, what are the dangers? Well, we've seen throughout the 20th century in particular the consequences of phenomena such as, or, or ideas such as group guilt. I mean, I talked to Yon Mi Park uh, two weeks ago. I'll be broadcasting that on my podcast. He's um, an escapee from North Korea. And her family were outcast to some degree because her grandparents were landowners. Um, and that, and so part of the oppressive class, right? They, they had undeserved privilege because from the revolutionary Marxist perspective, property is theft. And so if you own property at the time of the revolution, then you were nothing but a common thief. And because class and group are the critical uh, markers of identification, you're tainted by your association as a member of the privileged group. And so in North Korea, for example, there are people who are in concentration camps, multi-generational concentration camps, who are born there and die there because their grandparents or great-grandparents were landowners. And the idea of that the group is the proper level of classification enables you to generate hypotheses like class guilt, or let's say racial guilt for that matter. It's a sleight of hand to turn class guilt into racial guilt, and that's basically what's happened to Marxism, let's say, over the last 30 years. It's, it's moved from an, an analysis of the economic classes at the group level to, to race and other markers of identity. But it's the same old story. It's just in new clothing. I mean, do we really want to be part of a society where our culpability is predicated on our group membership? I mean, yeah. our entire culture is predicated on an idea that's absolutely antithetical to that. Um, and make no mistake about it, the critical race theorists who are at the vanguard of uh, this insistence that group membership defines the essence of humanity, they're perfectly aware that their doctrine runs directly in opposition both to enlightenment rationality and to a deeper Judeo-Christian ethic that stresses the sanctity and inviolability and responsibility of the individual. This isn't a trivial battle. It goes all the way to the bottom. That's why there's so, such a war about the idea of meritocracy. There's a war on the idea of merit itself. If everything is power, if everything is power, and all hierarchies are tyrannical. There's no such thing as merit. There's just oppression. And you have to ask yourself, do you really believe that? And I don't believe that. I mean, the institutions that I've worked in, by and large, were functional. And the people who were only using power, who were authoritarians, they didn't do very well. People cottoned on to their tactics quite quickly. And if they did happen to wrest control of a institution, a company, for example, the probability that they would run it into the ground promptly was extremely high. You know, our, our society is based on, fundamentally based on something like paternal reciprocity. And so one of the things I've noticed, for example, is that the people I've really admired, whether they were in the professorial domain or in business or entrepreneurs or artists, took a tremendous delight in mentoring people that one of the primary motivations for them as they acceded to higher and higher positions of authority was the ability to identify promising young people 
and to provide opportunities to them and to open doors for them and to train them. And like there's a fatherly, a deep fatherly pleasure in that that's far more compelling and powerful than the arbitrary exercise of power. And you have to be absolutely cynical beyond belief to believe that motivations like benevolent fatherhood aren't part of what makes well-functioning hierarchies work and last, especially when people are members of them voluntarily without compulsion. And that's not to say that our hierarchical structures can't become corrupt. They, they do become corrupt, and, and we have to always stay alert to that and fight against it with truth and with free speech and with attention. So there is this feeling that the current revolution will burn itself out fairly quickly, that this will pass, it's a storm cloud, we'll return to the sunny day soon. Do you think that? Well, you know, I've learned never to count out the Americans, speaking as a Canadian. I mean, your country has been through all sorts of upheavals in the past. Things were quite unstable, say, between 1968 and 1972, probably about as unstable as they are now, perhaps even more so. And you sailed through, you know, with flying colors, and you have an incredibly diverse culture with many, many pockets of independent strength, constant creativity, constant ability to renew yourselves in the aftermath of setbacks. So I'd always be loath to count the Americans in particular out. Um, having said that, I believe that the threat posed by these nonsensical ideologies is genuine. I certainly believe the universities have been corrupted to an almost untenable degree. I see the, and, and perhaps to a, a degree that's actually fatal to the universities themselves. Um, I see the same thing happening increasingly in the education system, you know, for high school kids and junior high and so forth. Uh, faculties of education are, are, are perhaps the most corrupt institutions in the university, and that's really saying a lot. Um, and they're spreading their, their uh, critical race theory nonsense, let's say. It's not just nonsense, because it's also malevolent. So it's more than nonsense. They're spreading it as fast as they possibly can. Um, there's no, it's not a necessity that we get through this unscathed. Um, I think it's the most likely outcome, but that also assumes that people of goodwill don't remain silent and allow themselves to be pushed around by a tiny minority of noisy radicals who have cornered the market on moral propriety and are using it as a weapon. It's 3% of the population, maybe, something like that, 3 to 5%. It's so nice to be reminded of that. So two quick questions. Why has the majority allowed itself to be bullied by what you describe as a tiny minority of unhappy people, of radicals? And, and mm -hmm. second, what does the majority do in the face of this? What does the average person, leaving politics aside, doesn't matter who you voted for, mm -hmm. but you believe in kind of the core tenets of the country, how do you respond to these challenges right now? And why haven't people? Well, I think the f part of the problem is the problem of deciding where to draw the line. I, I just talked to Paul Rossi, who's a New York high school teacher who wrote a column for Barry Weiss's Substack, where he decried the movement of progressive ideas, so-called progressive ideas, into the curriculum at the private high school, Grace Church, I believe, that he taught at. And of course, he was promptly fired for his efforts. Um, although he has been offered many jobs in the aftermath of that, so that was heartening. In any case, um, we talked about that a fair bit, and part of the problem is, well, where do you draw the line exactly? You know, when, that clip you played when, when at the Monk debate where I was talking about white privilege, I was trying to force my opponent's hand and say, well, okay, I have white privilege, well, just exactly, exactly how much do I have, because I'm not going to stand for adopting an infinite amount of it. You know, we, if we're going to have this discussion, we're going to define our terms. Um, of course, that never happened. But, but it's, a, it's a very tricky business to decide when enough is enough. So Paul Rossi himself said that when the anti-racism curriculum was first developed at Grace Church, 
he was enthusiastically in favor of it. And you think, well, of course he was, because he's a decent person. And who, who isn't in favor of anti-racism? Right. Right? That's I mean, right. Yeah. Well, so the, these ideas come in in the guise of morality, and, and a morality that, that's so deep in some sense that its validity is undeniable. Well, of course we have to fight racism. And, and, but the devil's in the details. And so, you know, I'm not very fond of buzzwords, slogans. Slogan means battle cry of the dead, by the way. That's its etymology. Um, diversity. Well, who's against diversity? Um, equity. Well, that sounds good, but it means equality of outcome. And so that's not so good because equality of outcomes means no differences are tolerated fundamentally. Um, Diversity, inclusivity. Well, who isn't inclusive? Who doesn't want to be inclusive? I mean, even if you're the harshest capitalist in the world, you at least want the opportunity to exploit everyone equally. Well, these are all wolves in sheep's clothing. And if you stand up and say, well, enough diversity talk, well, then people shake their fist at you and call you a Nazi or a supervillain magic Nazi, in my case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and well, so 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 the so the the cost. You see, you have to you have to stand up and say that you're against something that sounds good at some point where it isn't obvious that it's crucial for you to do that unless there's something wrong with you. And then right. what's going to happen? And this will absolutely happen to you. This will happen to you. You will get jumped. You'll get isolated. You'll get attacked. And my observation has been. A mob of 20 people on Twitter is enough to stop, a, to make a corporation, to make a multinational corporation apologize for its real or imagined wrongdoings. And it's devastating to an individual. We, we seem to react psychologically to such things as if 20 angry neighbors showed up on our doorstep with pitchforks and, and, and torches. And, you know, the logical conclusion to derive in a situation like that is that, well, maybe you did something wrong. Right? I mean, that's what someone who isn't a psychopath would think, is like, well, all my neighbor's upset. Maybe I said something stupid. And so it's very, very difficult to draw the line. And I've been talking to many moderate Democrats about this problem, because most Democrats are moderate. Um, but they don't have a story to push back against the radicals with. They don't have a romantic, compelling story the way the radicals do. And they, they have a great difficulty figuring out when it's gone too far exactly. So that's something we have to decide as a society. You know, I'm, I mean, I don't like the diversity, inclusivity, and equity triad. I think that there's something deeply rotten about that discourse. And any, uh, any attempts that are made to alter the structure of a social institution based on those principles is, in my estimation, to be regarded with extreme skepticism. Um, so it's a technical problem in part. And then you said, well, what can individuals do? And well, in chapter three of my new book, Beyond Order, the chapter is called Do Not Hide Things in the Fog. And um, the idea there is that, you know, you'll notice at some point that something is bothering you. Maybe something's bothering you about work. Maybe the new HR initiatives <laughs> calling you a systemic racist, let's say, or calling the organization systemically racist and calling you racist either unconsciously or consciously by misusing psychological tests that have no validity whatsoever for the purpose they're being put to, by the way. Um, maybe that's making it difficult for you to enjoy going to work. Okay? Maybe your conscience is bothering you a little bit. And what that means is maybe you have something to say. You know, and you don't want to say it because, well, you have a wife or a husband who depends on your income. You have children, and these are not trivial concerns. You know, and so you just put off saying something, but that just makes it harder to say it the next day and makes you a little smaller and then even harder the next day, and then you're a little smaller again. And, you know, if you have something to say, it's, it's a sin to not say it, right? It's, it's not appropriate, especially in a free society. And so, but, 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 but what if you find yourself, as so many do, and you just described it well, in a position where you could lose everything if you do say it? Do you, are you still, do you think, obligated to say it? Well, you know, people ask me why I 
was willing to speak out about the matters I did speak out in Canada. And for me, it was a matter of being more afraid of the alternative. You know, the Canadian government put forward a piece of legislation that compelled speech, essentially, that required people on the pain of punishment by law to use um, pronouns that, that the identity politics folks were, were um, what would you call, promoting. Um, and I guess that was the hill I chose to die on because I felt that it was absolutely inappropriate move on the political front to compel speech of any sort. I mean, your Supreme Court forbade that, except in limited cases in commercial speech, I believe in 1942. I thought it was an inappropriate foray of the political sphere into the, well, into the religious sphere, actually, because I think that voluntary speech is sacred. Your, your capacity to engage in voluntary speech is sacred. Um, and, and so I, I objected. The reason I objected was not so much a consequence of any courage on my part, but because I was more afraid of the alternative. So that's, and this is something I learned as a clinician too, is many people that I've seen were stuck in, as a clinician, were stuck in jobs they found unrewarding, and that was eating away at their spirit, you know, day after day, and they put off having to make that articulated and clear, because then they'd have to update their CV and look at the inadequacies of their background training and put themselves on the job market. It's a real pain, you know, but the alternative is to while away the decades at a job that kills your soul. And that happens bit by bit, and so it's not very dramatic, but over the long run, it's, it's hell. And so, you know, if you have something to say and you're not saying it, then as far as I'm concerned, you're just storing up some hell for later and for more people and maybe for your children. So it's not, things that aren't good don't go away because you ignore them. They just get worse, generally speaking. You yes. hide things, they grow, and you shrink. And so sometimes you're, you're, you, you can pick your poison. That's what you've got. And I would say pick the poison that's in accordance with your conscience. You know, if 100 teachers across the United States stood up like Rossi did, the the incursion of critical race theory into the curricula of private schools, let's say, to be specific, would stop. But that isn't going to happen. And you know, Rossi decided he would speak out because increasingly he didn't, he didn't like what was happening to the students in the school. Um, but he also found himself less and less interested in going to work. So what you're so, saying is there, there aren't a hundred courageous teachers with integrity in the entire United States, which I think is the most depressing thing I've, I've well, heard in a long well, time, I wouldn't, but I, I think you're say, probably right. I wouldn't right. say that exactly. Well, I wouldn't say that exactly because of what we already talked about. You know, you pay an inordinate price for this. Yes. But, but the, the price isn't, if things are tilting in a direction that isn't appropriate, the, the price isn't escapable. It, it's already there. It's already happening. And by avoiding confronting it, in all likelihood, you're just going to make it worse. Yes. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. So, um, and I, I think people have to consult their own conscience and, and decide, you know, do you have something to say that you're not saying? And then you have to be very careful about it. You have to get your arguments. You have to marshal your arguments. You, but I would also say it's better to do it thoughtfully and carefully and voluntarily than to find yourself you know, push beyond your tolerance at some point and then blurt out something stupid generated by the resentment you feel at being oppressed without a voice for so long. And then you're really in trouble because, you know, you've said something extreme and you're going to definitely get pilloried for it at that point. That's exactly right. So, and that's nicely, that's nicely put. I, I, let me ask you one final question, just since we are talking about your life, which intersects with these ideas at, at so many turns. You made your decision 2016 not to say what the government of Canada was prepared to force you to say. You decided, I can't do that. It violates my conscience. My soul's at stake. I'm not doing it. Looking back on that decision five years later, your life is completely different from what it was. Are you happy that you made that decision? Was it worth it? Well, I wouldn't say I'm happy that I made the decision. I, I, I wouldn't say that my life has been particularly happy over the last five years. It's been stressful beyond comprehension. Um, for a variety of reasons, but, and I would say, um, 
being pilloried on a regular basis publicly is definitely part of that. Um, but you know, you, you, you make your decisions in life. And I decided when I was very young, I'm in my mid-20s, that I was going to say what I believed and see what happened. I talked to you earlier in the talk about adventure, you know, about the adventure of truth. And I don't think, think I'm happy about what has happened. And I certainly have dragged my family through their fair share of, well, both hell and, and also incomprehensible opportunity. It's ex expanded our lives in both directions to a tremendous degree. But it's certainly been an adventure. It's not been dull. And I don't believe that it, I don't believe that it was a mistake. But I don't, I can't say, you know, that it's made me happy. It's, it's too, the consequences have been far too overwhelming for it to be encapsulated in an emotion like happy. That, that's, and it's not like I don't long for happiness. That would be just fine. My life is very, very complicated, to say the least. Do you regret so, it? I guess might be a better way to put it. Do you regret your decision? I have my moments where I wish that I had my life back the way it was. I had a very good life. You know, I li love being a university professor, and it's unlikely that that will occur again for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm on leave at the moment. I li loved my clinical practice. Um, I had a very, I had a lovely life, and that's been terribly disrupted. Um, it, but it doesn't matter because I made my decision long ago that I was going to say what I believe to be true and, and take the consequences. And so, see, I think that we talked at the beginning of this interview about gratitude, right? And I said it's a form of courage in the face of the catastrophe of existence. And so it's an attitude that you adopt voluntarily and that you have to practice. It's a decision to be grateful. It's a decision. And here's a decision in relationship to the truth. And I believe that this is something that everyone decides for themselves, whether they know it or not. See, I believe that the consequences of telling the truth are, there are no, whatever happens as a consequence of telling the truth is the best thing that can happen. It doesn't really matter how it looks to you at the moment, or maybe even across the years. Because you have to, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an article of faith in some sense. Do you believe that reality is better constituted as a consequence of truth or falsity? If you believe that reality is best constituted as a consequence of truth, then you have a responsibility to speak the truth. And you can't assess the consequences and say, well, that was a mistake because part of the decision that reality is best constituted as a consequence of the truth is the decision that no matter what happens is the best if it's a consequence of telling the truth. And so that's what I conclude. It's like, this is what happened because I said what I had to say as clearly as I could say it. And that's as good as it could be. Now, w whether or not that's good, well, it's good compared to all possible alternatives, all possible realistic alternatives. That's an article of faith, as far as I'm concerned. You know, our culture is predicated on the idea that truth in speech is of divine significance. It's the fundamental presupposition of our culture. Well, if you believe that, then you act it out. And you take the consequences. You're going to take the consequences one way or another, you know. So. You want the truth on your side? Or do you want to hide behind falsehoods? That's what principle looks like. Dr. Jordan Peterson, we appreciate it very much. Thank you and Godspeed. Tucker Carlson, today is the name of the show. New episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here on Fox Nation. Of course, we will see you every weeknight, 8 p.m. on the Fox News Channel.